46 through to 56. And this is Mary's song. Luke 1, 46. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Mary stayed with Elizabeth, that's her cousin, for about three months and then returned home. It works okay. But, uh, good to see you here this morning, braving the cold. We're not quite out of it yet, but uh, I think we may well be with the next uh, couple of days. Um, I would encourage you to, I'm sorry you've got to put with me two weeks running, I'm not quite sure why this week's been inserted, it, it wasn't planned until a few weeks ago, but uh, I would encourage you on Christmas Day to try to bring a friend or family member if you can, you may be quite surprised uh, of folk who perhaps normally wouldn't want to come to a church service, very often would come on Christmas Day. We have carols that they know well, and I'm sure the message, as always, the message from God's Word will find hearts to touch and bless. So be prayerful to invite friends, neighbours, and other members of the family, and let's see this place really full as we thank God for his precious gift of the Lord Jesus Christ at Christmas. Now, I'm always very nervous following Mervyn. <laughs> uh, it will not be as deep as it was last week, I assure you, because his knowledge of scripture is so much greater uh, than mine. But I want us this morning to have really simple thoughts, but I pray thoughts that will bless us in the preparation of this week and also over this Christmas time. So let's bow our heads and pray that God would be pleased to speak to us now. Our Heavenly Father, it has been a joy again to sing these lovely carols and one or two that perhaps we haven't sung so regularly, but words that just remind us of the most precious gift that could ever be given to this earth, the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. Lord, we know that Jesus is, is eternal, that he has always been and always will be, that he is God incarnate. And Father, in many ways it is easier for us to to grasp a baby even in a manger uh, and growing up as a young boy and into a young man than it is to think of eternity and part of the Godhead of heaven. And yet, Father, that is the baby that we are thinking about this Christmas time. That is the baby who gives us cause to sing and praise him. That is the baby who caused Mary and others in the Christmas story to burst into praise and song, the message that changed the lives of those shepherds for all time, the message that can bless our needy world, our hearts and lives afresh this Christmas time. So Father, speak to us, we pray. Keep us attentive to your Holy Spirit as you minister to us. And may there be a ready response of thankfulness and praise from our hearts for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. 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 Not only am I nervous following someone of the stature of Mervyn Popplestone last week, but I'm also a bit nervous um, following dear Andy, because uh, Andy, I have to say, I, I told him afterwards, you, you've stolen my message for Sunday. Because <laughs> I've had on my heart ever since uh, 
Albert phoned me and said, could I step in and do this morning, these Christmas songs. And I sat at the back on Friday night for the carol service. And in one sense, my heart sunk when Andy said that he was going to speak about the Christmas songs. But afterwards, after I told him that uh, you, you've taken my sermon for Sunday morning, I hope you realise that, Mr Little, um, he said, Richard, it was just a prelude. <laughs> and he said, I've set the scene, now you give it to them. So I've got to do what Andy said and give it to them. And that's you. And uh, it's a joy to turn back again, isn't it, to these lovely songs. If you'd like to turn back to Luke chapter 1, if you have a Bible... That is the first one we're going to look at. But as Andy said quite rightly uh, on Friday evening, Christmas is a time of singing, much more than any other time probably of the year. You don't often walk down Bedford Town Centre and hear bands playing and people singing. You don't often step onto a railway station and it's uh, not been so much this year because the one thing missing is trains, of course, with all the strikes. But uh, I did go through Waterloo uh, a couple of weeks ago and there was a lovely choir singing there on the platform in the rush hour at Waterloo. Beautiful carols and a really clearly trained choir. And it's not normal. That isn't what you normally hear at Waterloo Station in the rush hour. And people usually rushing around to find their train. It's interesting how many paused who just listened. Some contributed to the, the charity that they were singing for, etc. <coughs> and other songs. Now, some of them, you were pretty good. It does show you know your old pop songs because when Andy was asking you what year and what, who sung this, that and the other, you got most of them right, I know, on Friday. But I did quite well this year because the first time I heard I wish it could be Christmas every day was the middle of October. <laughs> now, that's a lot better than last year because it was early September last year when we started singing that. And that's one of those songs, once you've heard it, it just keeps coming, doesn't it? And it's a job to get out of your mind. Some of them are tremendous, some of them are nonsense, absolute nonsense. But all of them, I think, just have a, a special something to inject into this time of year. Not only just to let us hear them singing, but they're so catchy that before you know where you are, uh, you're jingle belling and everything else uh, in your own mind and in your own heart. I don't think it's a bad thing. And... The songs that we see in the Bible here are songs that I would pray we will feel ourselves singing in different ways over this Christmas period. And the first one of the four that we're looking at this morning, and the same theme really, uh, in slightly different ways, I believe is present in all of these four Christmas songs. And the songs really have one simple theme, salvation, salvation. Christmas is all about salvation. Jesus came for that very purpose, to save his people from their sin. And yet each of these songs have a slightly different twist or emphasis on salvation. And in Mary's case, with the um, song that Ruth um, read to us a little earlier from Luke chapter 1 verse 46 onwards, it's very much personal. If you look at those words again, it starts, my, my soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my saviour. For he has been mindful of the humble estate of me, if you like, his servant. And it goes right through this lovely song. It's personal. It's about relationships. Sadly, the statistics would suggest that there are more family breakups over the Christmas season than at any other period of the year. Um, I, I suggest that's probably because it's the one period of the year when people are together. And once we're together, the problems start, don't they? When people are living at the opposite end of the world, it doesn't really matter quite so much. But it's sad that we, we hear so much about relationships being broken. And we live in an age where we're getting used now to not having relationships one with another when did you last speak to your doctor face to face <laughs> when did you last have a hospital appointment where you saw someone face to face rather than on the phone when did you last ring to speak to someone without getting 
an option of 35 numbers to press if you want to talk to everyone from sort of the king of the country downwards to the humble servants, etc., etc. That's the world we live in. We distance ourselves now and we get used to it. And if we're not careful, you become almost acclimatised to keeping a distance from one another. When I'm on my, my railway trips, I, I will confess that I rather like keeping a distance. Um, not because I don't want to probably be near anyone, but I, I like to keep my eye on what's going on outside on the railway and keep a look out for the trains as they go by, etc., etc. And, and in this country, that's very little difficulty because everyone looks for the seat furthest away from anyone else on a train. The first time I ever went to Ireland, it was a real shocker. Uh, I was making my first ever trip in Southern Ireland from um, Dublin through to, I think I was through, going through to Cork. It was quite a long journey, one of the longest there is on there. And I was so pleased because the train was nearly empty. And I, I had a carriage. I was the only person in this whole of the carriage. I've got my maps out, my number books out and camera out. And it was going to be a wonderful solo trip until it got to the first station. You know exactly what's coming. One dear semi-drunk Irishman got on this train, got in this carriage, looked around at probably a hundred empty seats and came and sat next to me. <laughs> and never stopped talking from there till Cork, uh, such like. But bless his heart, I don't think he knew much what he was saying, but nonetheless, he wanted company. He wanted a relationship. And although I didn't really want it myself at that period of time, but by the end of the journey, it'd been quite fun, uh, if we we're honest. And I've learned a little bit about uh, Southern Ireland as well. But although we get into a kind of isolationist uh, concept for life, that is not how God wants us to be with him. God is not someone who wants to be distant. He wants to be reverenced. He wants to be honoured. And we cannot but see how Mary does, in a very personal way, honour and um, magnify, I believe is the word I most like in verse 1. It says glorify in the, in the NIV. And that's wonderful in itself, to glorify <laughs> God. But I think in the AV and one or two other translations, and when we used to sing it, Sunday by Sunday in the choir at St John's. I got quite fed up with it and having it almost every week. But that terrific word, my soul doth magnify the Lord. And that's what Mary was doing, wasn't it? Mary had, was, remember, a young teenage girl. We don't really know exactly how old she was. But A, she would be impressionable. B, she would not be expecting to be pregnant and suddenly to be told that she was to be a, a mother without being married to Joseph was a total disgrace, particularly in that era uh, which we're talking about this morning. And this young girl was fearful. It said she was. It must be fearful enough to be a, presented with the angel, um, but to have the message that she had. And yet, although we don't know her, her background and upbringing that much, one thing we can clearly learn is that she had been learning about her God and she knew things about her God. And when she received this message, her heart exploded really with praise to magnify the Lord. I like the word magnify because it means enlarge, doesn't it? And that's what I pray will be the response to our hearts, mine as well, this Christmas time, that we will be enlarged in our understanding and our love and praise to God. A few weeks ago, um, I can't remember quite where it was or who it was, but there was a great deal of excitement um, in space exploration. You may have heard of this. And they had got the most powerful telescope that had ever been invented. Years it had taken to put this telescope together. And you saw the, the people who were in the like Cape Canaveral type of situation um, suddenly getting really, really excited. And this telescope magnified so much more than any telescope ever before it that they were able to explore further into the deepest parts of the universe and outer space. And their excitement 
was that they had found a black hole. <laughs> Do you remember that a few weeks back? Mm. A black hole. And this got the top news on almost every channel and every programme you put on for a day. Such excitement because they've been able to magnify and find a black hole. Friends, we've got something much more exciting than a black hole. We've got a white one, we've got a glorious one, we've got a shiny one, we've got the light of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. And oh, how we need to magnify in our hearts uh, that wonder of his truth. So this young, confused, frightened Mary sings this wonderful song of personal salvation. And I pray we have that same personal salvation because that is the relationship that God intends for us. Remember in John 10, 14, Jesus said, I know my sheep and am known of mine. Again, a relationship. I've often said, haven't I, before, you know, how can you have a relationship with a sheep? Two words in the, their vocabulary, and I don't know what they are in other languages. Barbar is probably not translated much the same anywhere you go. Um, but we are like sheep in so many ways. The Bible tells us we like sheep have gone astray. And it's good at, as we come towards the end of the year, sometimes I think just to pause. Are you as close, am I as close to God as I was a year ago? Is my faith as strong as it was a year ago? Is my love for the Lord and my love for one another as Christians as deep as it was a year ago? Most of us have to take our cars in once a year, don't we, for an MOT. I don't know whether I'm an eternal pessimist, but I always expect it to fail. <laughs> didn't this year. <laughs> I didn't find anything to do this year, which was really, really nice. But perhaps that MOT as we come to a year is something we need to do. Have you got a heart like Mary? Have I got a song in my heart like Mary that magnifies the Lord? I have to say, fear not at times. You go around and various places I go to and um, I was at a chapel only a few weeks ago. It's quite a challenge. My heart sunk when they introduced me. It's Richard Cray. We all know Richard because of the railway. <laughs> Yesterday afternoon, probably Watford, we were talking about, wasn't it? In the middle of a, a, a concert, etc. You see, what are we known by? What is the mark of our life? It's what we magnify. And that, to me, was, was a challenge there and then. I, I, I'm just going to hold back on talking about railways when I'm at Chile, I'm doing it, haven't I? <laughs> you see what I mean? It's, it comes so easily to us. It's what excites us. It's what interests us. It's what we enjoy. We might be talking about our family. We might be talking about our home and things we've done, our new cars, whatever it might be. You see, Mary's heart magnified her God. And if a young teenager, fearful as she was at that moment of time, can have such a personal <coughs> relationship with her God, then how much more should we? In 2 Timothy 1 verse 12, Paul says those lovely great words, we've often sung in him, and we, I know whom I have believed. I know whom I have believed. So Mary, as we leave Mary here, could be the challenge to us. Do we know whom we have believed? We go through the motions. We make the plans and probably we've already planned dates for Christmas next year, let alone get through this year, etc, etc. We have to do that. But we need to be in a relationship, a personal one with our Lord. We move on later on in chapter one to verse 67. And this is Zacharias. It's a very visionary song. If Mary's song is very personal, this one, if you <coughs> dare to say, is almost national, universal. Let me just read it quickly. His father, talking about John's father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, for he has come to redeem his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness 
and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the path of peace. John's vision really here is, I say a vision, it, it really is a vision, isn't it? Because the Holy Spirit just opened up his heart. He'd been quiet for quite a time, hadn't he? <laughs> can't imagine that being struck dumb for months on end because he didn't believe that the miracle of the birth of his son would be possible he was old his wife was old they prayed probably for much of their lives that they would be able to have a child particularly a son and it hadn't happened and probably they'd accepted that situation by now and suddenly they're told in this miraculous way that despite being late in life they are to have a son and what a son is going to be and Zachariah can't be that can't be we often think that it, the birth of Jesus is the only miracle this is a miracle in itself the hand of God upon these uh, this couple's life and because he didn't believe he was unable to speak for that long period of time but then when his lips are open when the child is born what a wonderful song he sings and he sees the person that is to, to follow his son. His son is to be a preparer. His son is to be someone who lays the way. Now, I dare suggest that that is the challenge for all of us who are Christians. We are to be John the Baptists. I'm not going to say we need to grow our hair. Well, some of us can't grow our hair these days, but <laughs> we're not to necessarily grow our hair till it almost falls around our feet as probably John did. We're not to necessarily go and live in the wilderness, no. God wants us where we are. He wants us in our, uh, our homes. He wants us in our families. He wants us in our communities. But he wants us to be doing what John was given the challenge to do and given the gifting to do, to prepare the way of the Lord. None of us can ever bring anyone into salvation. We can only prepare the way or people to find Christ through the Holy Spirit. Get thinking back to those years of the, the Dick Saunders Crusades and Billy Graham and others, some of you like myself were, were often counsellors and we sat alongside people who had felt moved by God's Spirit we trust during the service uh, and to come forward to make a, a commitment. We saw some, didn't we, here at Reynolds uh, many years ago now, I can't remember what year it was, but that's, that's not relevant. What was very clear is that in almost, not quite, but in almost every situation I found myself in talking to someone, you could identify another person who had been influencing their lives before this point of time. Dick Saunders or Billy Graham would get all the credits and the plaudits. It was their preaching or under their preaching that God broke through. But they've been prepared. Remember one young man, sadly he, he, he died quite young, but one young man who had got a, a lovely, lovely girlfriend, I, I still remember the couple, and it was at the Royal Albert Hall for the annual rally many years ago. And we had, a, we had over 8,000 people there for that particular crusade afternoon. And he had come with his young lady who was, uh, a, I think in a choir in a Methodist church, etc. cetera. Um, he'd come down from Skegness uh, on a coach and the intention was that they were going i think it was to the ideal home exhibition little did he know that everyone on that coach bar him had other ideas before they ever went to the ideal home exhibition uh, they were going to the royal albert hall for an early afternoon uh, crusade meeting and he was a tough guy i still remember him with his leather jacket on and everything else a lovely young man and uh, he was absolutely broken under the preaching of the word of God. And there were so many went forward that afternoon, we couldn't use the counselling rooms, it was full. And I ended up sort of crouching on the floor with him in a corridor with people walking backwards and forwards. Um, and we couldn't even get him to pray the prayer of acceptance because he couldn't stop crying. 
and he was a real tough guy and he was tremendously saved and for the brief years he had as a Christian before he died very uh, sadly at 40 um, he, he set up a, a, a house church in his own home and he started speaking and leading Bible studies and he just longed to serve the Lord great well well preached Dick what about that young lady who had invited him what about that girlfriend who prayed for him what about that girlfriend who loved him spiritually as well as, as physically and she had been preparing she was a preparer what was interesting is he didn't know but she'd gone forward as well <laughs> and she realized that she'd never really given her heart to the Lord personally and what she didn't know a mother and father had gone forward as well and that whole family <coughs> were joined together that afternoon and if one sense had almost been preparing one another we, we can be preparers I said about bringing a friend Christmas Day that would be preparing them God may speak to them I, I can't guarantee that I don't know God's will is it is a mystery to us all but we, we trust him in his um, in his wisdom but we should be ready to prepare because God's kingdom is to be spread the hesitation perhaps if you call it hesitation of his return it, it gives us those days of opportunity those days of grace and oh how we need to use them as John would do to prepare the way of the Lord and of course it was John who when he saw Jesus those 30 odd years later walking down the road he said look here is the Lamb of God the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world what a vision he had what an understanding he had and all he had been doing if I can say all he'd been doing was a preparer and he stepped aside even his disciples left to follow Jesus and John upset not at all glorifying God and Zachariah here in this lovely <clears throat> lovely song is able to say that uh, that this young son is going to be a preparer to go before the Lord and to give his people the knowledge of salvation we can do no more but God wants us and requires us to do just that and then the third um, one is, is really the angel's song in Luke chapter 2. I won't read all that, we had it on, on Friday evening, etc, etc. But the message that came to the shepherd, it actually, uh, in, in the Bible, says the angel said, well, probably the angel did say, the singing was to follow. The singing followed the message, if you like, and the message was that there is born this day in the city of David a saviour who is Christ the Lord and after the shepherds had been given that great message it says there and they were of course were, were fearful as well then verse 13 suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel and here's our song praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favour rests the angels chorus this is the origin of <coughs> salvation it is God given God has intervened before the birth of Jesus there'd been a long period I think 400 years or so without God intervening he'd intervened through the prophets in the Old Testament days and then there was this long spell of time because that's not a long spell with God but it's a long spell here on earth and then what a wonderful way to break that silence to come into our world again and to bring this wonderful wonderful message and the angels sung as I believe only angels could sing and the theme of their message really was all about Christ the Lord I don't know how we relate to the angel song but one thing it did do was point to God to Jesus and all of our worship all of our singing <coughs> should be not just from lips not just from words but from a heart and a heart that not only is thankful for what God has given us but surely hearts that are endeavoring to follow the person 
that we have praised the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it's no use us singing heartily, even in lovely choirs as in fern, unless Christian choirs, unless our heart is determined to try and live as closely to the person of Jesus as we possibly can. And that life was a life which was faultless. You say, well, I can't manage that. Of course you can't. If we could, he would never have needed to come. He would never have needed to be born. He would never have needed to leave heaven. If we could live a perfect life here on earth and never sin, he would have never needed to go to a cross. He would never have needed to suffer and die. But it is because God knew the frailty of our hearts and of our lives and the way that we so often fall to temptation and the way that we seem unable to really live lives that are holy, even as Christians, that he sent his son to be our saviour. And it was and is God given. Time's going very, very fast. And the final one or the fourth one that I want to speak about just for a few moments is Simeon, which equally um, Andy did mention on Friday. But thinking back, you know, there is a fifth one, isn't there here? We haven't got time to look at it in detail. But we, we've looked at the angel's song to the shepherds. But what about the song of the shepherds when they returned from the manger? These, these weren't people who went around singing. These weren't people who went around joyful. They were serious, quiet, earnest men who sat for long periods of time like me on my trains, probably trying not to speak to anybody <laughs> and were not used to having uh, noise and um, all these festivities that were now going on. But they'd seen the Lord. They'd seen the Lord. Now they'd seen the Lord as a baby. And I'm sure all of them had seen many, many babies before. But there was something special. And they had gone on their own initiative to see for themselves. Every Christmas, this, you get to the Christmas story, and I, I want to be careful what I say now. I shall never be asked again. But to a certain extent, I, I'm almost fearful of being asked to speak at Christmas services. Because you begin to think, what is there more to say? What is there to learn new that uh, you've not known a hundred times over the years? And yet, almost without exception, every year there's just been something that has stepped out from the Christmas story and really impressed itself upon my mind. And this year, it's been more than anything else, the response of the shepherds. If you go to any nativity play, or anything that's done on, on television or whatever, almost without exception, you will find part of the story is the angel telling the shepherds to go to the manger. The Bible does not tell us that the angels told the shepherds to go. The angels presented the message. <coughs> the angels presented the opportunity. The angels presented what would be found but the shepherds, it said, after the angels had departed, said to one another, let us go. Let us go. So you see, it wasn't going under instruction. It was <coughs> receiving, if you like, an invitation. It was looking at a possibility. It was an interest. It was an excitement. It was an anticipation. And I'm sure there was much confusion there was no confusion when they come back, was there? The, the shepherds returned, it says, praising God and then telling others. I don't know what their song included word-wise, but I, I guess it was, it was a better one than wish it could be Christmas every day, I really do. But for the shepherds, it would be a new joy every day. The shepherd's song, there's a lovely song that the London Annual Choir often used to sing, the shepherd's song, and we often overlook it. But that was my blessing this Christmas time more than ever before. They made the decision. And that's perhaps as we come to a close again today, that decision is for you and I to be making in our own hearts. Do we just want Christmas to be the, the tinsel and all the things that I love personally all around us? Or do we want it to be an occasion where this year, 2022, with all the horrors that this year has held for us and possibly what next year may hold for us, humanly speaking. Do we want this Christmas to be something different? Do we want, like Mary, to a heart that magnifies 
the Lord? Do we want to see the global opportunities um, that Zechariah was able to see and to be preparers like John was to be? Do we follow the angel song in lifting up our praise beyond our lips with hearts <laughs> that are thankful and like the shepherds, will we take the initiative and go? Only then can we be like Simeon. Simeon was in the temple. He was an elderly man. And he, we know that uh, he was very, very dedicated to the work in the temple day after day. And we take up the story there in Luke chapter 22 from verse 25. It tells us that he was righteous and he was devout. And he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. He was waiting in expectancy that although the years were beginning to roll and he was probably like some of us thinking, you know, how many more Christmases will we have? Well, I wasn't thinking of Christmases, was he? But uh, thinking of the promised Messiah that uh, would he actually come. And he longed to see him before he died, as did dear Anna, which we won't look at uh, again this morning. But it tells us that it had been revealed to him that he would not die until he saw the Lord's Christ. And I'm sure as the years rolled on, he must have had some times of doubt that this would actually be fulfilled. But there that day, his expectancy was fulfilled. And he was moved by the Spirit. And as the Lord Jesus <coughs> was brought in, he says this lovely song, doesn't he? My eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. That's really remarkable for the Jewish situation of that day. This is all-inclusive salvation, Jew and Gentile. The prophets hadn't seen that as clearly, some did in, in various ways, but, but this was quite amazing. This was prophetic, all under the power and influence of God, all inclusive salvation. And after this wonderful um, experience, he said that, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace. His life could now be complete. The longing of his heart had been fulfilled. The expectancy in his life had now been brought to a conclusion. I don't know what you're expecting for Christmas. <laughs> um, we've struggled sometimes even to think of things to say that we want for Christmas because we're all so blessed, if we're honest, aren't we? But may our expectancy be that we will see that salvation in you that we will have a heart that will long to praise God in him. And that like these characters from scripture, we will have a heart that just bursts into song and thankfulness to our wonderful God. I'm going to close with just a couple of verses from Ephesians, where it tells us this. Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and submit to one another out of reverence for him. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the joy of Christmas. Thank you for the message of song that blessed uh, came from Mary as she was blessed by that uh, angelic visit and the message that she was given. Thank you for her obedience and for her joy. Thank you for uh, the wonderful angel song and for Zachariah as he was able to see again your hand upon his life and the wonderful way that you're going to use his young son. Oh, thank you, Lord, for the shepherds and the change. Thank you that they took the initiative to go themselves to see for dear Simeon, who even in the latter years of his life was still expectant to see the Lord. Lord, may we see you this Christmas time. May we see you this very morning in, the, in your spirit and through the eye of faith. And may this be a blessed Christmas that gives us a song to sing.
of praise to magnify our Lord. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Amen.